I'm not a big fan of these headphones, by the way. Ahmed for that uh, overly uh, ecstatic uh, <laughs> introduction. That was a little bit uh, much, but Zakum for for being here this evening. It's it's a blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that He gives us opportunities to come to the house of Allah and to speak about Him and to remember Him. The Prophet ﷺ teaches us that any people who come to the house of Allah and they gather to remember Allah and to learn نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ sakina. The first thing that happens to these people is that tranquility descends upon them. وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ rahma, And they are enveloped in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ And the angels surround them. وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembers him in his mala. He remembers us in his mala. And so the fact that we are gathered here in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask that inshaAllah this gathering is one of those gatherings. بِإِذْنِ That this is a gathering that is full of tranquility, that is surrounded, that is surrounded by the malaika, that we are enveloped in the mercy of Allah and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is remembering us. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala habibina wa shafi'ina wa maladina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi fi al-awwaleen, wa salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi fi al-akhireen, wa salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi fi al-mala'i al-a'la ila yawm al-deen. In the name of Allah, the Gracious, the Merciful, to Him we belong and to Him we shall return. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom and in His infinite mercy to send peace and blessings upon the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon our parents. We ask Allah azza wa jal to have mercy upon our brothers and sisters who are facing great hardship. Wherever they may be, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Bangladesh, China, Africa, wherever they may be, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon them all. For brothers and sisters, if we do not remember our brothers and sisters, we will be greatly asked about that on the Day of Judgment. When we knew that our brothers and sisters were facing great hardship and our hearts did not move for them. So every opportunity we have, we remember our brothers and sisters who are struggling. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we seek refuge in Him from knowledge that does not benefit. One of the beautiful aspects of our deen is the idea of intention. It's truly a remarkable notion in Islam that we don't really fully appreciate how powerful it is. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ That verily and truly our actions are based on our intentions. وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ امْرِئِمْ مَا نَوَى And every person gets based on what they intend. This is very powerful and very beautiful on many levels. That the simple idea of intending something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. So much so that the ulama historically, they had a very beautiful tradition in that they would be basically very creative in the types of intentions they would have. They were constantly businessmen of intentions. One story goes that a scholar was sitting with his students and he asked, the doorbell rang or the door, someone knocked on the door. One of the students quickly jumped up to answer the door. And when he did it, his sheikh got bothered and he asked him, he said, why did you open the door? He said, I opened the door because I didn't want whoever was knocking on the door to disturb us. The sheikh said, that's your only intention? You opened the door with one intention. And I was going to open the door and I had prepared 70 intentions. 
by simply opening the door he was going to receive hasanat for 70 intentions he said I was going to see if maybe I intended that if the person at the door needed a fiqhi answer or question I would give it to them someone needed a hadith I would give them a hadith someone needed a tafsir I would give them tafsir someone had a need I would fulfill it for them one of my family members were coming I would do well by them one of my neighbors were coming I would see what they needed Someone who maybe had a haja, a need, I will take care of it for them. And the list went on of 70 intentions that he had prepared in his mind. So why do we not take advantage then of this beautiful trait of our deen? And I want us to quickly, before we begin this series, I want us to together, and this is going to be interactive, I want us to throw out what are the possible intentions we could have for this gathering this evening. I don't know if this went off or not, but we'll continue. What are the possible intentions that we could have for this gathering this evening? So I want us to begin, inshallah, let the microphone take care of it, but let's focus. What are the possible intentions we could have for such a gathering? And you can raise your hand and I'll, I'll point at you. Anyone? No one? Good intentions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep the keep the bad ones to yourself. <laughs> Andrew. A beautiful intention that we could have a presence of mind of increasing our taqwa. What else could we intend by this gathering? Being patient. What else? Very good. Whatever we learn here, we can pass it on to people who are not here. But there are, some, there are some more obvious ones that I think you guys need to hit at. Learn about Islam. Learn about Islam. That's a great one right there. <laughs> Let me help you guys out. I think that every time we come to the masjid, and especially when we're coming to a gathering of learning, we can intend very obvious things. We intend to come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So many ahadith speak to us about the virtues of coming to the house of Allah. We can intend that we're coming to the house of Allah عَمَلًا بِمَا فَعَلَهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم. Being in the, in the sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. We can intend to come to the house of Allah to pray in jama'ah. Every salah that we pray is times 27 in jama'ah. We can come to the house of Allah to be in a state, in a gathering of knowledge. This is our intention every time we're coming. We intend to come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be with righteous people. Inshallah, we come to the house of Allah and we are around righteous people. I intend to come to the house of Allah to bring my family to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I intend to come here this evening to hear about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I intend to come here to learn about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I intend that I want the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be my guide in this life and the afterlife. And the intentions can go on and on and on. And inshallah, every single time we come, we have these intentions ready in our mind. Because not only does Allah see that you had the presence of mind to prepare an intention that shows thoughtfulness, that shows that you are someone who doesn't just simply mindlessly act, follow the waves. Allah sees in you and in us that we've taken, that we've had the presence of mind to think about what we're doing. And also, not only does Allah see that in us, but inshallah He will make easy for us what we desire. So if we desire to be close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inshaAllah Allah will put blessings and make it easier for us for that to be the case. And so inshaAllah bi'ithnillah ta'ala, every time we come, we come and we intend, and even if we're driving in our car, we have our friends or we have our family, whatever we have, we speak to our kids and we speak to our spouses and we speak to our friends, what is our intention? What are we going to do? And inshallah, we get hasanat for all of that. And inshallah, Allah makes it a reality in our lives. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us out of clay. And as human beings, we're made up of two primary entities. This material side of ours, this clay side. But there's also another key element that 
comprises who we are. And that is the divine breath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَنَفَخْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِنَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Sayyidina Adam that we blew our divine breath into him. And so what we are made up of is this clay part and this divine breath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the problem with this dunya is that this dunya likes the clay part. It likes that material side of us. And so what this dunya does is that it consumes us and it attaches our material selves to the dunya. And it overwhelms the divine breath. And it covers the divine breath. And that is the secret of our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The secret of our relationship as the creation of Allah to Allah azza wa jal is this divine breath. And so what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does with His creation is that He sends them messengers and prophets. And these messengers and prophets, their duty is to reconnect us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every prophet and every rasul was sent with unique traits and unique features that were needed for their own people and that were significant to their own times. So we take for example Sayyidina Ibrahim. Ibrahim alayhi salam was Abu al-Anbiya. He is the father of the Anbiya. And so the unique trait that was chosen for him was what? Khalilullah. The close friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason why the ulama say, the reason why he needed that khulla, that close relationship with Allah azza wa jal, was because he was the father of Abrahamic faiths. And so, to be able to be that, the head of that, that, that pillar, he needed a close relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa alayhi salam, the one who was sent to Bani Israel, and when he was sent to Bani Israel, they were so far, they have so far subjugated themselves to Fir'aun. They saw Fir'aun as this larger than life creature. He would say, Anna Rabbukum al I am your high Lord. And they were obsessed and enamored with idols and idol worship. So they had become so rigid and so rigid in their subjugation to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the scholars say they needed divine speech to shake their core. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them Kalimullah, Musa, the one who spoke directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ulama say that the staff of Musa alayhi salam, when he went to Allah azza wa jal, Allah called him and Allah said, Alqiha ya Musa fa'idha hiya hayatun tas'a. When he told Musa alayhi salam, take your staff and throw it, this rigid staff, and when he threw it, it is suddenly a serpent or a snake that's moving. The ulama say that this is a metaphor for what Kalimullah, the Kalam of Allah, was to do to the people of Bani Israel, to shake their core, to sh turn them from the stiff entity into a moving object. Isa alayhi salam, Sayyidina Isa, Jesus alayhi salam, he was sent to a people who were spiritually corrupt. Spiritually corrupt. They were consumed by the dunya. All they sought was notoriety, leadership. They wanted everything that the dunya had to offer. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Ruhullah, Isa alayhi salam. He was known as the spirit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason why they needed this spiritual message was because of their moral bankruptcy. And so the ulama say that Sayyidina Isa didn't actually go to them with a law, with a written law like we have. He was simply a spiritual messenger to the people, to his people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends to this earth, to his creation, the last and final messenger, Khatimul Anbiya wa Khatamul Anbiya, the seal of the Prophet and the last and final Prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The last and final prophet to reconnect his creation to him. He sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to all of mankind for the rest of time. 
وما أرسلناك إلا كافة للناس بشيرا ونذيرا. We sent you to all people as a warner and as someone who is going to bring glad tidings. وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين. محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم was sent as a mercy to mankind. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is the one that Allah سبحانه وتعالى Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, says, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allah, the creator in the heavens of the earth, Allah, the creator of you and me, the creator of all things, says what? Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allah himself sends peace and blessings upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the man that we are talking about. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one that Allah azza wa jal in the Quran says, قُلْ أَطِيعُ اللَّهِ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولِ Obey Allah and obey His Messenger. The one that Allah azza wa jal made it, that He is half of our proclamation of faith. When someone takes a shahada to become a Muslim, what does he have to say? أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله. There is no iman without Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. There is you cannot become a Muslim without Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. This is who we're talking about. Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, the one who was taken on the night journey, lifted to the highest of heights. The one when he was taken from Mecca to Masjid al-Aqsa. In Masjid al-Aqsa, he led 124,000 prophets and messengers in congregation. All of the prophets that we know of, Sayyidina Ibrahim, all of the great prophets, Sayyidina Nuh, Sayyidina Musa, Sayyidina Isa, Sayyidina Ismail, all of them prayed behind Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is our prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one who was taken to the highest of heights, Sidratul Muntaha, and he with Sayyidina Jibreel, and Sayyidina Jibreel told him, You have to continue, I cannot. And he met with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, and he, was, he received the blessing of prayer from Allah Azza wa Jal in the highest of heights. The one who saw us, saw the state of the believers in Jannah and Jahannam. The one who receives the greatest miracle that ever touched this earth, the miracle of the Qur'an, was given to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is khayru khalqillah, he is the greatest of Allah azza wa jal's creation. And the greatest of Allah azza wa jal's creation received the greatest book that ever touched this earth, this earth Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Huwa sayyidul awwaleena wal akhireen. He is the master of this world and he is the master of the afterlife. He is the one, brothers and sisters, that on the day of judgment, when we collectively will run from prophet to prophet, we will run to Sayyidina Adam, and we'll say, Ya Adam, please intercede for us with Allah Azza wa Jal. We will run to him and Adam will say, Nafsi, nafsi, I, I cannot do anything for you. I have my own issues that I have to concern myself with. Go to Sayyidina Nuh. Then the people will run to Sayyidina Nuh. We'll ask Sayyidina Nuh, Ya Nuh, please, please intercede for us. He said, nafsi, nafsi, go. Go to someone else. I cannot help you. We'll go to Sayyidina Ibrahim. We'll speak to Sayyidina Ibrahim. We'll ask him, please intercede for us. He'll say, I cannot help you. Go to someone else. Go to Sayyidina Isa, we'll run to Sayyidina Isa, we'll ask Sayyidina Isa for intercession. Sayyidina Isa will say, I cannot do anything for you. Go to Sayyidina Muhammad. We will run to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what is his response? Ana laha, ana laha. I will intercede for you. We run to the Prophet because we know there's nowhere else to turn. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will go to Allah azza wa jal. And he will prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah Azza wa Jal will tell him, Irfa ra'sak, sal tu'ta, washfa' tu shaffa'. Ask and you will be given Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ask and you will be given. Intercede and I will intercede. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Rabbi, Rabbi, ummati, ummati. Ummati, ummati. And the narration states that the Prophet ﷺ will go back and forth to Allah Azza wa Jal until the last person who has an Adam's weight of Iman in his heart will be removed 
from Jahannam. This is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is our Prophet. This is the Prophet that we are talking about in this series. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one who Allah azza wa jal said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That verily and truly you have in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a great guide and a great example. Brothers and sisters, the list goes on of the things that we can just touch upon that expresses the greatness of the man that we're speaking about. Not just that he was a great leader or a great political leader or a great governor. He was everything. He is everything. Allah Azza wa Jal dignified the Prophet Sallallahu in ways that we cannot imagine. He is not your average Joe. He's not a simple average guy. And he's also not a mythical detached figure. He is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our Prophet. So Ibrahim Alayhi Salam Khalilullah. Isa Alayhi Salam Ruhullah. Musa alayhi salam, Kalimullah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who is he? Habibullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The name that we chose for this series is Habibullah, the beloved of Allah. And of course, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is many things. He is Khalilullah. He is a close friend of Allah. He is Kalimullah. He is someone who spoke to Allah azza wa jal directly. And he is Muhammad. Muhammad meaning the one who receives praise non-stop. A horizontal kind of praise. From the beginning to the end, he'll never stop being praised. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is Ahmad, the one who receives the highest form and the greatest form of praise. Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he is Mahmud, the one who is praised. And he is Hamid, the one who praises. And he is Al-Mustafa. The chosen one by Allah Jalla wa ala. What else is he? He is Al-Bashir al nadir He is the one who, who brings, who warns us and the one who brings us glad tidings. He is As-Siraj al-Munir. He is the bright source of light for us. He is Al-Hadi. He is the guide. He is Al-Da'i. He is the one who calls. He is Al-Hashir. The one that we will be gathered around on the day of judgment. And many, many, many names of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the really unique one, Wallahu Alam, is Habibullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some may ask, what is the difference between Habibullah and Khalilullah? You know why Khalilullah means close friend? So what's the difference between Khalil and Habib? A Khalil is a close friend and the love does not surpass these two people. So I love this brother, inshallah, he loves me, inshallah. And that love stays between us two. But hub, hub not only encompasses the two parties involved, but it engulfs everyone who is involved in that process. And that is why the relationship between Allah and His Messenger is a relationship of hub, because that is the only trait that can encompass all of humanity, for all of times, with all of the tribes, جَعَنَّاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا Tribes and nations to know one another. It is hub, it is prophetic love that unifies us all. And the word hub is used so interestingly in the Quran and Sunnah. When Allah Azza wa Jal, when He speaks about His own love, He says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ Say, if you truly love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِي Follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ If you want the love of Allah, follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah will love you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith says, وَاللَّهِ وَاللَّهِ لَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَحَدُكُمْ حَتَّى أَكُونَ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ نَفْسِهِ وَوَلَدِهِ وَوَالِدِهِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ وَاللَّهِ you will not believe, Zakallah khair. You will not believe. You will not believe. Your iman is not complete. You have no iman. If Allah Azza wa if the Prophet ﷺ is not more beloved to you than everything, than your nafs, than yourself, than your children, than your parents in all of humanity. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Habibullah. 
our relationship with the Prophet ﷺ is one of hub. And this hadith that I'm about to narrate manifests this meaning beautifully. And I'll read it because it's long. But I think the meaningfulness of it is great. And it truly, truly exemplifies this notion of hub. Anas ibn Malik. Anas ibn Malik was the servant of Allah, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He was the gift of Umm Sulaim, the, an- the mother of Anas, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa When all of the women were bringing to the Prophet gifts, the one gift that Umm Sulaim had to give to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was Anas. And, you know, just this came to mind now, but a beautiful story about Anas that I always love to, to think about is one time the Prophet ﷺ sent Anas out on an errand. And he went out and he saw some kids playing. So he started to play with them. And he obviously became distracted and didn't do what he was supposed to do. So the Prophet ﷺ noticed that he was late. So he went out to find him. And he saw him playing with the kids. And so he walked up to Anas and he put his hands over the eyes of Anas like this. And he said, yeah, and, and he said, do you know who I am? And the Prophet, Anas knew exactly who he was. I mean, these are the prophetic hands, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, touching him. There is no more intoxicating presence in the presence of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He knew exactly who was covering his eyes. But he acted as if he didn't know. And then when the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, removed his hands, he said, what happened, Ya Anas? Where did you do? Well, I sent you out on the errand. He said, oh, Ya Rasulullah, I came out and the kids were playing. I got distracted, so I played with them. The Prophet ﷺ didn't smack him. The Prophet ﷺ didn't yell at him. The Prophet ﷺ did not hit him. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? Anas radiallahu anhu says that all he did was he smiled at me and walked away. That was the Prophet ﷺ. Anas said, Wallahi, I never heard the Prophet once complain about food. He never cursed at me or yelled at me or hit me. This is Anas radiallahu anhu and this was his relationship with the Prophet sallallahu So this hadith says, Anas an Anas ibn Malik, Khadim Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the servant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi And Anas says, Ma fi bayti Aisha radiallahu anha illa ana wa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa Abu Bakr. We're in the house of Aisha, and the only people in the house of Aisha at that time are myself and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says, يَا أَبَا بَكْرِ O Abu Bakr, لَيْتَ أَنِّي لَقِيتُ إِخْوَانِي I wish, I wish that I would have met my brothers. لَيْتَ أَنِّي لَقِيتُ إِخْوَانِي أخواني, he repeats, I wish that I had met my brothers. فَإِنِّي أُحِبُّهُمْ I truly love my brothers. فَقَالَ أَبُو بَكْرِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ نَحْنُ إِخْوَانُكَ He said, قَالَ أَنْتُمْ أَصْحَابِي You are my companions. إِخْوَانِي Pay attention. إِخْوَانِي الَّذِينَ لَمْ يَرَوْنِي My brothers are the ones who never saw me. وَصَدَّقُونِي وَأَحَبُّونِي And they believed in me and they loved me. صلى الله عليه وسلم The Prophet's brothers are the ones who never saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم but they believed in the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and they loved the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم حَتَّى أَنِّي لَأَحَبُّ إِلَىٰ أَحَدِهِمْ مِنْ وَلَدِهِ وَوَالِدِهِ even, he's telling you Abu Bakr, I'm even more beloved to them than their children and their parents. I mean, if that's the definition for brotherhood, then where are your ikhwan? He said, no, you are my companions. Antum ashabi. And then he says, Ala tuhib ya Abu Bakr, qawman ahabbuk bihubbi iyak. Subhanallah. He says, Ala tuhib ya Abu Bakr, do you not love Ya Abu Bakr? Qawman Ya Abu Bakr. Qawman Ahabbuk. A people who loved you because I loved you. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
I think the connection of love is beyond clear. They love you, Ya Abu Bakr, because I love you. He says, Bala Ya Rasulullah. For he says, Love them, Ya Abu Bakr, because of the love that they have for you, because I love you. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Brothers and sisters, I want to make something very clear. I know when we start talking about love, people get a little bit, you know, uh, you know, this is not Hallmark love, by the way. We're not talking about, you know, Hallmark card love. We're not talking about the romanticized Hollywood notions of love. This is not the kind of love that we're talking about. That love is very superficial. What we learn in Hollywood about love and romance, this is very superficial love. That's not even love. The love that we're talking about and the love that the Prophet ﷺ had for us and the love that Allah Azza wa Jal had for His Messenger ﷺ is a very unique love. It is a love that is predicated upon a deep sense of servitude and sacrifice. A willingness and a desire to sacrifice everything that I have for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the kind of love that we're talking about. A readiness and willingness to do whatever it takes to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A readiness and willingness to alter my life and to change everything that I am involved in for the sake of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the kind of love that we're talking about. And if you really want to understand this love, look at the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Because they embodied true prophetic love. These are people who absolutely transformed their lives for Allah and His Messenger Muhammad ﷺ. In the early years of Mecca, Abu Sufyan was, was terrorizing the believers. He was the husband of Hind bint Utbah. And one of the people that he was terrorizing was Zayd ibn Dukunna. And he was torturing him and he was going to kill him. And he took him out to the outskirts of Mecca. And he crucified him. And he told him, Atuhibbu an yakuna... <coughs> Excuse me. Atuhibbu an yakuna Muhammad makanak? <coughs> Would you prefer that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in your place right now? He suddenly... Awakened, and he said, "Ilayka anni, fa wallahi aladhi la ilaha illahu, la uhibu an yusab Muhammad shauka, wa ana wa ahli fi afiyat min al maut." But he said, "Wallahi la azim, I would not want the Prophet to be pricked with a thorn, and I and my family are saved from death. I would rather die and my family die than have the Prophet pricked by a thorn." And so Abu Sufyan, he said something very profound, even in his shirk. He says, Wallahi ma ra'aytu ahadan, ahabba ahadan ka hubbi ashabi Muhammadin Muhammada. That Wallahi, I have not seen a people who loved someone like the love of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Muhammad. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Abu Bakr was a very big businessman. The ulama say that he owned something around eight or nine businesses, whatever that meant in that time. But he was a, a very well known, and, and he was a part of Qurashi high society. He was known as a nasab, someone who could, you come to him and he could tell you, and this was a very elevated trait, he could tell you what your exact lineage was, just by the looks of you. He is someone, one day, he walks out. I just want to just give you a taste of the transformation that occurred in this, these men's life, these lives, men and women. One day he walks out, out of extreme hunger. And he bumps into Sayyidina Umar. And Sayyidina Umar says to him, Ma akhrajaka min baytik? What brought you out of your home? He said, Ya Umar, I, I'm starving. I haven't eaten. So Sayyidina Umar says to him, Wallahi ma akhrajani min bayti illa ma akhrajaka min baytik. Exactly what brought you out of your home is exactly what brought me out of my home. I'm hungry, I'm starving, I haven't eaten. Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Abu Bakr. 
As they're walking, they see the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Ma akhraja kumam baytikuma? What brought out? <laughs> sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What brought you out of your homes?" He says, "Ya Rasulullah, we're starving." He says, "Wallahi ma akhraja ni min bayti illa ma akhraja kumam min baytikuma." What brought you out of your home is exactly what brought me out of my home. I'm hungry. Let's go find something to eat. And so they go and they walk, and then they find a group of Ansar sitting, and the story is long, but they're fed by these Ansar. And the story is actually very beautiful, but for time's sake, they're fed by these Ansar, and the Prophet ﷺ turns to Abu Bakr and Umar, men who sacrificed everything for Allah and His Messenger. He said to them, this is from the Na'im that you have to be thankful for. لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ they sacrificed everything for the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah, the Prophet is telling them, Thank Allah for this na'im that you're eating. You will be asked about it on the Day of Judgment. Brothers and sisters, when Abu Bakr was traveling with the Prophet ﷺ in Hijrah, one moment he was standing in front of the Prophet, and once behind him, and once to his right, and once to his left. And the Prophet saw him as a crazy man running around Sayyidina Muhammad. So he says, What are you doing, Abu Bakr? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I stand in front of you, so I think someone's going to attack you from behind, so I run behind you. And then I think someone might attack you from your left, so I run to my left, your left. I think someone's going to attack you from your right, so I run to your right. And he continues to do that the entire time. And when they go to Ghar Hira, he walks in and he blocks all of the openings that are in the Ghar with his limbs. And then the Prophet ﷺ puts his beloved head on the lap of Sayyidina Abu Bakr and he goes to sleep. And as the Prophet's sleeping, Sayyidina Abu Bakr is bitten by a snake, snake in his foot and it's a poisonous snake. And he's in such excruciating pain, but he's not about to awaken the Prophet ﷺ. So what does he do? He continues to sit there in pain, but the pain is too much so he begins to tear. Until a tear hits the cheek of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet awakens and he says, What's wrong, Ya Abu Bakr? Ya Abu Bakr? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I was bitten by a snake while you're sleeping. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with his beautiful lips, he goes and he removes the poison from the leg of Sayyidina Abu Bakr sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to even begin to tell you what Sayyidina Umar did in sacrificing. The entire, the complete transformation that occurred in his life. These were a generation of people who absorbed everything that the Prophet ﷺ had. Sayyida Aisha, when she comes to describe the Prophet, what does she say? كَانَ قُرْآنًا يَمْشِي عَلَى الْأَرْضِ They saw the Qur'an embodied. The Prophet ﷺ one of the beautiful things the ulama say is that the Prophet ﷺ is an embodiment of the Sharia. He is an embodiment of the Qur'an. So when you study the life of the Prophet ﷺ, you become exposed to aqidah, creed. You become exposed to fiqh. You become exposed to usul. You become exposed to hadith. You become exposed to tafsir. You become exposed to a, you become to a macro or a microcosm of Sharia embodied in Muhammad ﷺ. Brothers and sisters, I want to say this. I know right now, many of us have different psychologies playing. Some of us are thinking to ourselves, what have I been missing out on? How have I not learned about the Prophet? How do I not have a relationship with the Prophet ﷺ? He's clearly such an integral and significant entity in my life. And I claim to be a follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But what does the Prophet actually mean in my life? Do I actually see the Prophet in my life or not? Do I sacrifice my health and my wealth and my family and everything for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam or not? This is a very important question. And the reason is because we may think to ourselves, you know, I've tried enough times to make the change and I see that the Prophet ﷺ is important 
but I'm not sure how to quite do it. A lot of us treat these kind of religious issues similar to the idea of reading a book. You know, all of us believe that reading a book is a good idea. And we'll say, you know, inshallah, you know, maybe this weekend I'll pick up a book, I'll go to Barnes, I'll read a book. Yeah, it's a nice idea. I'm sure it's going to enrich me and be good for me. But, you know, most likely we'll never really pick up a book. Unfortunately, that psychology that's being applied to that book is exactly how we treat the Prophet ﷺ. And the problem is, is that we've developed these seemingly functional lives without Muhammad ﷺ in it. So it's deceiving. Because right now if we go home and we don't pick up a book of seerah, we don't think about the Prophet, our life is going to seem normal. I don't feel that urgent to have to change and learn about the Prophet. But that is the great deception of this world. And there's a verse in the Quran that is, in my mind, terrifying in this regard. Where Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لا يبصرون بها ولهم آذان لا يسمعون بها أولئك كالأنعام بل هم أضل أولئك هم الغافلون الله سبحانه وتعالى says فلما نسوا when those who were reminded ما ذكروا and ذكر صيغة صيغة فعل meaning that it was not one reminder or two reminders it was reminder after reminder فلما نسوا ما ذكروا به when they forgot, they've been reminded time and time again. They've been told time and time again. It's time to change. It's time to do this. It's time to do that. And we just push it aside. فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ We open up the dunya to them, basically. This world that you've become so enamored with, it's opened up to you. And we travel in this world. We have hearts, but we don't understand anything. We have eyes, but we don't really see anything. We have ears, but we don't really hear anything. They are like animals. Actually, بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلْ They are lower than animals. هُمُ الْغَافِلُونَ Those are the people who are heedless and mindless. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the greatest dangers that we can fall into as a community. It is complacency. It is when we become okay with the status quo. A, a, an analogy that might bring the meaning closer. Think about a sports player who has an injury in his leg. And to continue playing, the team doctor will shoot injections into his leg so that he can what? Continue walking on it and continue playing on it. But as he's playing on it, what is he doing? He's actually damaging himself even more. But he doesn't realize it because there's this seemingly functional life that he's... So he's playing, he's going, coming, running, and then he becomes what? He becomes addicted to these things that basically numb his pains, turn his mind off from what he's actually going through, and then he just leads this seemingly standby-ish functional life. That's kind of analogous to what we do to ourselves in this dunya. Is we become so consumed by the dunya, we become so enamored by it, Nasullah fa'ansahum anfusahum. They forgot about Allah, so not only do they forget about Allah, Allah makes them forget about themselves. And we just become robots in this dunya. And so when we come to the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, to remember the Prophet Allah subhanahu of the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are thinking to ourselves, I need to sincerely recognize the urgency of having Muhammad in my life. And it begins, it begins by knowing who the Prophet ﷺ was. This is how it starts. Inshallah, if we are sincere and we come to the masjid every week trying to understand who the Prophet is, we will begin to understand what the rights and the responsibilities of the Prophet is for us. And how critical and how urgent it is that we revive the Prophet in our lives. 
Because, brothers and sisters, the biggest fear that I have for us, and I don't mean to scare any man, and I don't mean to make anyone feel hopeless, but the biggest fear that I have, on the Day of Judgment, a people will run to the Prophet ﷺ because that is their Prophet. And they will run to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet is excited to embrace them. But the angels will come and they'll block these people. And you'll say, Ya Rasulullah, they're not from your Ummah. They claim to be a part of your Ummah. This is the biggest fear that I have. That we claim to love the Prophet ﷺ, but we don't actually love the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Shafi'i says, لَوْ كَانَ حُبُّكَ صَادِقًا لَأَطَعْتَهُ إِنَّ الْمُحِبَّ لِمَنْ يُحِبُّ مُطِيعُ if your hub, if your love for the Prophet ﷺ is honest and true, then you will submit and you will follow and you will obey the one you love. So brothers and sisters, I want us, inshallah, we will begin this series next week, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, and we will do a complete immersion into the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Cultural anthropologists, when they want to understand a given society or a tribe or people, they do what is called a complete immersion. They go into this society, they learn about customs, habits, traits, dress, food, drink, social organization, atmosphere, temperature, location. They learn everything. And for us to begin to understand who the Prophet is, we want this kind of full immersion into the life of the Prophet. We want to know how the Prophet looked. We want to know how the Prophet sounded. We want to understand how the Prophet felt. We want to understand how the Prophet acted. How was the Prophet ﷺ when he dealt with his wives, with his kids, when he dealt with his companions? How was the Prophet ﷺ with his enemies? How was the Prophet ﷺ with humanity? How did he feel about those who were in his time and the woes who came after? What did his society look like? Why did Allah choose the Arabian Peninsula? What happened to the Prophet ﷺ when he was born? What happened with the incident of the rock, the black rock? What happened during Hayf al-Fudul? It's not just a matter of understanding and learning and memorizing events, but really embracing the life of the Prophet so that we can develop a functional way of integrating the Prophet into our lives. We need, we want to, inshallah, we'll work on this together. How do I functionally integrate the Prophet into my life? What do I have to learn about the Prophet's life that can make him real in my life? Because that is the hope, that is the need, and that is the urgent need that we have with regards to the Prophet wasallam. And finally, I'll close with this, insha'Allah. A man came to the Prophet, one of the companions came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he, his face was yellow. And he told Ya Rasulullah, I'm, I'm scared because I remember that I see you now in this dunya, but in the afterlife, I realize that I'm not going to see you in the afterlife. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, don't worry. The man said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have a lot, but Wallahi, I love Allah and I love you, Ya Rasulullah. I love you, Ya Rasulullah. That's what I have. I love you, Ya Rasulullah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Anta ma'man tuhib. Al mar'u ma'man yuhib. That you will be with the one that you love. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Anas was sitting and he said, he said, Wallahi, Nothing was more pleasing to us than that, those words from the Prophet. Nothing was more pleasing to us than to hear that the, from the Prophet wasallam that we will be with the one that we love. So insha'Allah, let us dedicate ourselves to loving the Prophet wasallam, So that on the Day of Judgment, when we run to the Prophet, the Prophet wasallam will embrace us. When the Prophet knocks on the door of Jannah, and the Malaika say, who is it? And the Prophet Sallallahu says, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Malaika say, I were not allowed to open the door except for you. 
and the doors of Jannah open, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his ummah walk in. Insha'Allah we will be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa walking into Jannah. So let us dedicate these hours every week and even outside of this gathering to learning about the Prophet. Brothers and sisters, buy as many books as you can about the Prophet. Dedicate your entire year to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Wallahi, if you do nothing but read about the Prophet for the next year, that is the best thing that I think someone can do with their time. Reading about the Prophet. Because you're learning everything you need to learn. Let us dedicate our times to that insha'Allah. Let us bi'ithnillah. Let us embody, let us have the presence of mind to remember all of the intentions that we have in coming to the masjid. May Allah make us of those whose hearts are attached to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us of those who want to follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah make us of those who want to be in the presence of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this life and in the afterlife. May Allah azza wa jal raise us to the highest of heights in the afterlife. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our hearts in love with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May he make us of those who follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May he make us of those whose hearts are lightened and brightened by the Qur'an. May Allah azza wa jal make us of those who hear that which is beneficial and seek to apply it in their lives. I ask Allah azza wa jal to forgive our sins, to have mercy upon us. Wa jazakumullah khair. Wa sallillahumma ala Sayyidina Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا